Meet six-year-old Brooke. She was loud and creative and unapologetically vivacious. But I was also told that I talked too much in class, that I was bossy, and in a million micro moments to simply take up less space. But see, I really like telling people what to do. <laughs> and like many of you, I was told in class that even I could become President of the United States someday. And so I would close my eyes and imagine myself as an old man with white hair <laughs> giving speeches. This is true, I really did do this. Giving speeches to imaginary audiences on the playground. And see, this continued to happen in my mind until a certain person came into my worldview. Hillary Clinton. I said the name. <laughs> now, my parents did not like the Clintons but she was still the only person in my mind's eye that also got to give speeches with the big American flags in the background. So I learned very quickly that I needed to become more like a Hillary. And while she wasn't the head of state, there's this saying from my big fat Greek wedding where they say, the man might be the head of the household, but the woman is the neck. And she can turn the head any way she wants. <laughs> And so I thought, if I just be more like Hillary, I could have access to these spaces of power and influence. And so I became controlled, emotionless, stoic, and defined. <laughs> but here's the thing. This is what any leader, any woman leader in any industry had to be in order to gain spaces of influence. In the 80s and 90s, this was the playbook. And if you wanted to gain power and influence, you had to play. We saw this across the board, and we are still seeing it today. For, for fear of being too reactional, too emotional, too nasty, too controlling, I suppressed myself and suppressed myself and suppressed myself, as so many little girls do. I brought myself into a space of wanting to just be a statue of that vivacious girl that I once was. But see, I still wanted to help people. And so I got a degree in political science, and after becoming a master of fitting myself into a shell I never really wanted to fit in, I made it my profession. <laughs> so I did this for candidates, senators, governors, congressional people, city council, and mayors. I nipped and tucked and sliced and diced and chiseled them into pristine, polling approved perfection. I taught them how to spin how to say anything without saying anything at all. <laughs> and I taught them that they can take the soul out of what they believe in and make it bland just in case it's too spicy for the masses. This is the art of elevating a person higher than others to be in a space of reverence. And this has worked for decades and decades as our playbook until it didn't. The 2016 election changed my life. And whether you like Donald Trump or hate him, the reality is he is one of the most authentic leaders our nation has ever seen. And it is his authenticity that made him untouchable, not his stoicism. And for the first time, the American people said, we choose authenticity over reverence. And we are in an entirely new era. But this isn't an era that's only been led by him. This isn't a talk about politics or partisanship. I've mentioned both Hillary and Trump, so you guys cannot hate me. <laughs> the reality is, this talk is about power and influence and how we harness it. You see, it's 2019 now, and my playbook has gone out the window. There are women in Congress right now who are far cry away from the 90s female leader that I once modeled myself after. They are strong, formidable, and emotional. You see, these women are showing emotion with tears rolling down their faces, being absorbed into the Capitol floor. They're showing anger and rage at the caging of our children on the southern border, and they're showing fear at the divisiveness and vitriol that is facing our nation. But I'm not just seeing this in our leaders. I'm seeing this 
across all industries, in politics, in sports with Serena Williams, in movies like Frozen and Captain Marvel, and with Brene Brown leading the way in corporate America. Our cultural icons are shedding the pristine veil, and we are loving them all the more for it. It is not in spite of their authenticity that they are successful, it is because of their authenticity. It is what is selling those books, landing, the, landing those Nike contracts, making it rain, and yes, getting elected. But see, in order to truly appreciate just how far we've come, we must know what we have been through. So I'm going to do, in a minute, 100 years of the woman's experience in America. Are you guys ready? Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> OK. So it's 1920, and we do get the right to vote, but we still don't have access to property. We still can't have our own bank accounts, and we can't get a job. We have the one very small job of perpetuating the human race. <laughs> so we go on, and they try to take our wine, which does not go well. We hit into a Great Depression, and our husbands go off to war, where we are left for our children to be raised by ourselves. And if that weren't enough, we continue to step up because we have to go work in steel mills in order to support our husbands. If we're fortunate enough for them to come home, we are expected to not work. Then the pill comes along, and for the first time, we are allowed to choose work or family or both. Many of us choose both, only to discover that our ambition is not enough, and there's a glass ceiling that we cannot crack. So we work for 20 years to try to break this, all while still having a smile on our faces. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> because after all, Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did. She just did it backwards and in heels. You see, we are phenomenal women. Since the beginning of time, phenomenal women. This idea of the hustle is not a trend. You see, we are consistently phenomenal. But what makes us so phenomenal? What makes us able to be so consistently phenomenal, to last through the sands of time? It is our resilience. The idea that still, like dust, we will rise. You see, this is a muscle that no other has truly developed. It is the muscle of the heart. This chalice of overflowing strength does not come through the arm. It comes from inside. And it is stronger than anything else on the planet. And for the longest time, we have shown this through one-on-one -on -one connection, our resilience to our families, to our friends, to our communities. But still, we are in a new era. And we are starting to see that this tiny little thing called our spirit is being transcended into leadership of the masses. So where are we right now? We are in the era of authenticity, where we are saying we are no longer willing to wear the masks and play the game. This is showing up in men and women and everyone in between. Because a mask is not authentic. And you cannot be in relationship with someone if they are inauthentic. Because masks are only commodities that are bought and sold. And that is only a space for a transactional relationship. This is a space of self-discovery. And more importantly, self-acceptance. The ability to stand with my feet firmly on the floor knowing that I am confidently who I am. And what we must know is that while this is a critical piece, it is not enough for transformational leadership. We have to go even deeper. Vulnerability. The idea that we are not only knowing who we are, but we are willing to show you our soft spots and our imperfections. That we are making an offer to others. The idea that Will you take me as I am, as an invitation, exactly the way we are? It is a space for grace and compassion. The idea that I am simply because. And still, this is not enough for us as women leaders to solve these big problems. Being authentic is not enough. Being vulnerable is not enough because we are still not connected. So I ask of you today to be open to the idea that there is even a deeper level of leadership that we must tap into. 
And it is a terrifying word. Intimacy. Into me you see. This is a word that we are very afraid of in our culture. It is a word that is almost only reserved for spaces of a bedroom. So how can we be intimate leaders? The idea that we are fully transparent, it is not just our soft spots, it is our entire transparent selves. This is the only space where we can actually build real trust, connection, where a bond is formed. If vulnerability is an extension of the arms saying, will you take me as I am, intimacy is the other person holding it and saying yes. How can we be leaders if we do not see them? How can we be leaders if we are not letting them see us? How are we being leaders if we can't simply ask them to reveal themselves? And how can we be leaders if we don't even know ourselves? So we must think of the idea of I am because you are. The idea of our connection and bond as a human race. Humanity. I am because you are. And guys, we really need intimate leadership right now. You might think that our politics divides us, but I am sorry to tell you that politics is a mere symptom of the nation that is alone and sick. Well before 2016, from 2000 to 2016, we had a 30% increase in suicide rates. People not willing to even live anymore. In 2017, it was 1.4 million people who attempted it because it's not just the suicide rate, it's the people that are trying. And if that wasn't bad enough, in 2019 alone, we have had 399 mass shootings. That is more than one a day. And we are hurting as a nation. And we are numbing ourselves, trying to cope with the pain that we are not willing to see. And in doing so, we have an epidemic where 130 people die every day from opiates in this country. These are very big, real issues that will not be solved by chiseling and talking points. You see, this problem, while there is no silver bullet, is rooted in one core thing, and it's our connection with one another, the strength to be seen. And who better to lead our world's problems than women, if that's the case? But here's the thing, it has always been us. It is us and it has always been us who have been doing this. But there's a difference this time around. We are in a different space than we were 100 years ago. I truly believe, like this Avenger scene, that no matter how many instances or scenarios of how we move forward, there is still only one truth, which is we can solve our greatest problems when women are there and leading with their hearts. And because of the woman who came before us, those who have sought power and influence, getting a seat at the table in a room where it happens, reaching for that glass ceiling, they have made the sacrifices of their souls. And we honor them. Because of them, we are now starting to actually be authentic in these spaces. We are starting to finally gain an impact. For the first time in Western history, we are not just the next. You see, we are the doctors and the nurses. We are the teachers and the principals. We are the actors and the producers. And no, it's not enough. We have not arrived. It is not equal and it is not equitable. But still, there are many spaces that we can break into, including not just being the neck, but the head of state. The reality is, if we can reach into that glass ceiling, if we can lean in and reach out and touch it and break out, but we are also able to break into ourselves, we will not only be known as the leaders in the history books that we are now able to write, but we will also be known as the legends who showed what real strength looks like and how we solve the world's problems. Thank you.